You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. If you would please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew, chapter 26. This morning we read beginning at verse 26 and we'll read to verse 30. Matthew 26. We read beginning at verse 26. Now while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and giving it to the disciples, he said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's go to our God together and ask his blessing this morning. Lord, we are grateful as we gather in this place today, grateful as we sing hymns of praise to you, rehearse the truth with each other in song, grateful as we hear the scriptures read to us, grateful as we pray together, grateful to see the faces of our brothers and sisters and to have the opportunity to encourage each other and to be encouraged even by simply the presence of our family members in Christ. We know that we, as your people, gather here together as one and what unites us, we all have in common is that we are yours, that you have forgiven all of our sins, that you have made us completely acceptable before your holy presence. By the gift of the righteousness of your son, you have justified us, you've declared us right with yourself because you granted us repentance and faith in Jesus and by faith we received all that your son did to save us. What makes us one is that we love you. What makes us One is that we love each other with a love that's been poured out in our hearts by your spirit who now indwells us. And so, Lord, thank you for every day that we have to worship you, but every Lord's day when that worship is corporate. You bring us together. It's just a a glimpse of what our eternity will be. We give you praise. We pray that you would be with us this morning as we now open your word together. Help me to preach. Help us to listen. Holy Spirit of God, take the living word of God and do your living work in our hearts. And Lord, we ask that if anyone hearing me today doesn't know you, that you would bring salvation. But this is needful for us. This is needful for your people. And so, Lord, feed your sheep and edify your church. As has already been voiced in prayer, Lord, correct us where we need it. Strengthen us where we need it. Enlighten us where we need it. Lord, you know our needs better than we do. And so meet the needs of your people through the proclamation of your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Every passage of God's word 
makes us to feel our inadequacy. But there are certain portions of his word that when you come to them, they are so concentrated with truth that any attempt to extract all of that truth in one sermon especially makes you to feel your inadequacy. And this is one of those passages. What we've just read in verses 26 through 30 is packed full of profound doctrine. Here we find multiplied reasons for our worship. Here we find our Lord instituting an ordinance for his church that will forever remind us of the divine provision that explains our being rescued, our deliverance, our salvation. Here we have the ongoing promise through symbols, a reminder of our hope. Here we see the beauty of Jesus, which fuels our love and admiration for Him and our love and admiration for our God. And all of this comes to us against the backdrop of betrayal. Jesus, in the previous verse, has just identified Judas as his betrayer. John's account leaves the impression that as soon as Judas was identified, he left the room. John 13, 21 says, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. So John seems to indicate that as soon as he's identified, he leaves. In Matthew's account, in Mark's account of the Last Supper, you, you have... The supper being instituted immediately after Judas is identified. So that I think it is likely that he has left the room before Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because the Lord's table is for believers. So Judas has been dismissed. He's been identified. He has left the room. And now Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And so, so what you have is this this contrast, beauty, the institution of the Lord's Supper, against the backdrop of ugliness, Judas's betrayal. Light immediately following darkness. The love of Jesus in response to what amounts to the hatred of Judas. It is the remembrance of the greatest sacrificial loyalty in the history of the world. John 13 verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, and I love this, listen, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So when he institutes the supper, it is the memorialization of his loyal love for us. Immediately following the beginning, I mean, Judas goes to carry out what he's planned to do, the beginning of the most heinous act of self-serving disloyalty in the history of the world. This is the final Passover. 
the first Lord's Supper, the first communion table. And so it represents the closing of one era of redemptive history and the opening of a new one. It is shadow giving way to substance. It was preparation giving way to completion. It was the remembrance of a lesser deliverance, deliverance from Egypt, to the remembrance of the greatest deliverance, deliverance from the wrath of God. That which pointed forward to Jesus is now giving way to that which will point back to Jesus and forward to Jesus at the same time. A gift to Israel giving way to a gift for the church. This is an amazing moment that we're witnessing in the Word of God. And so this morning and this evening, we're going to consider it. We're going to look at these verses in both services. We're going to organize our study of it under four words. Let me just give you four words that I think capture what we find in these verses. We'll look at the first two this morning. We'll come back and look at the final two tonight. But it can be organized into four words. Number one, transformation. Number two, substitution. Number three, hope. And number four, worship. Transformation, substitution, hope, and worship. Let's read the verses again together. Verse 26, now while they were eating... Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it. And giving it to the disciples, he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The first word is the word transformation. While they were eating, after a blessing, when he had taken a cup, after singing a hymn, those four phrases speak of the Passover meal. What's interesting, and many commentators have noted this, the focus in our verses is not on the Passover meal. Matthew doesn't really say a lot about it. None of the gospel writers do. The Passover meal is simply the context in which Jesus will do what he does. It's chosen by Jesus for the institution of the Lord's Supper for a reason. It, it, the, the Passover meal is meant to be closely associated with what Jesus gives birth to because there is shadow giving way to substance. There is preparation giving way to completion. There is what pointed forward to Jesus now giving way to what points back to Jesus. But what is most important in this scene is not the elements of the Passover meal, but the elements from that meal that Jesus chose to use to memorialize what He is going to do to save us from our sins. That is what our focus is placed on. I mention that because it's not uncommon for Bible interpreters to go into great detail about the various parts of the Passover meal at the time of Christ. Interesting to me how, how we want to do what the gospel writers do not do. Why, why it is that we're so fascinated at times with preaching what is not there <laughs> instead of preaching what is there. And so you'll have all this discussion about the first cup and the second, and you know, various parts of the, <clears throat> of the Passover meal, even in some churches, you know, there's this reenactment of the cedar and all the rest. The gospel writers don't do that. William Hendrickson talked about this. He talked about the fascination with the Passover meal, and he specifically was talking about the prayers that would have been offered. And he says this, the words which the Lord used in this thanksgiving have not been revealed 
to try to reconstruct them from Jewish formula prayers would serve no useful purpose, how do we even know that our Lord availed himself of these prayers? We don't know. So what we do know is that he gathered to eat the Passover, but he then took that occasion to institute his own supper, his own memorial. He took the bread, he associates it with his body. He took the cup, he associates it with his own blood. And he made clear, even in that moment, that this was being set forth to remember him in the future. Luke 22, verse 19, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's amazing, isn't it? He's sitting there with them. And he says, I'm giving you something to remember me. The Spirit of God through Paul tells us the same about the significance of this moment, what it was given for, what it's meant to accomplish. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, Paul writes, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was, when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, Paul says to them, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Jesus gives us something to remember him by. It is meant to serve us, to serve his people until the day when he returns. No longer do the people of God celebrate the Passover. Now the people of God recognize our Passover lamb in Jesus himself. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 speaks of Jesus as our Passover lamb. It says this, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Jesus here talks about the blood of the covenant. For this is my blood of the covenant, verse 28. The Lord's Supper is instituted to remember Jesus. It also is instituted to commemorate the inauguration of the new covenant. The new covenant inaugurated in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Lord's Supper declares that we are no longer under the old covenant. I want you to listen to me carefully. The Old Testament is still ours. It is the Word of God. It is useful for everything that Scripture is useful for. It's not that the Old Testament has gone away. It is, it is the Word of God. We have 66 books in our Bible, every one the Word of God. And the moral standards of God that you find in the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament. They haven't changed because God doesn't change. But how he has chosen to administrate his relationship with his people and how he has chosen to make himself known to the world has changed. When you talk about the old covenant, you're talking about the Mosaic covenant. And by the, the, the Mosaic covenant, God administrated his relationship to Israel. And he was making himself known to the world through Israel. The new covenant administrates God's relationship with all of us who have placed our faith in his son after his death and resurrection. And God is now making himself known to the world, not through Israel, but through the church. And so the old covenant has no force over our lives as new covenant believers. It's instructive, just as the whole of the word of God is instructive in the sense of its moral commands and teachings, it has as much force as any other part of the Word of God. But when it comes to the specific way, the system by which God administrated His relationship to His people, it no longer has force over us. It is obsolete in that sense. 
The writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. He's not saying it was in any way imperfect for that which God ordained to use it. He's saying it's not the final way that God chose to administrate his relationship with his people. It served its purpose for its time, but there was something better on the way. Verse 8, for he finds fault with him when he says, behold, the days are coming, he declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declared the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So, a way that God dealt with His people under the Mosaic Covenant, Jesus comes, dies, is raised, and now God has given us His Spirit. He has written His law in our hearts. He does not manage His relationship with us in a way that we live in fear, given external commands by which we are trying in some way to walk with God according to some system that way. No, instead, His law written on our hearts so that now we live for him from the inside out. Galatians 3.24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And so the old covenant serving like a teacher, like a preparer until the fulfillment of all that those shadows and symbols spoke of arrived, Jesus himself. Now that covenant is obsolete and it is the new covenant that is in force. Wayne Grudem put it very well in his systematic theology. He says this, what then is the old covenant in contrast with the new covenant in Christ? It is not the whole of the Old Testament because the covenants with Abraham and David are never called old in the New Testament. Rather, only the covenant under Moses, the covenant made at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 through 24, is called the old covenant to be replaced by the new covenant in Christ. The Mosaic covenant was an administration of detailed written laws given for a time to restrain the sins of the people and to be a custodian to point people to Christ. Paul says, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions till the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, Galatians 3.19. And the law was our custodian until Christ came, Galatians 3, 24. So until the Messiah arrives, God gives the Mosaic Covenant to restrain sin in His people, a detailed set of written laws by which He administrated His relationship with them that is no longer in force over the Lord's church. We are now living as new covenant believers. Jesus has given us something better, something better you heard Jeremiah 31, 31 read earlier, 31 and following, down to verse 34. Listen again. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Central to that new covenant promise is the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
This is why John the Baptist presented our Lord the way that he did, Matthew 3.10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That is, he is the one who will judge all of mankind. That's the baptism with fire. He is the one who will give the gift of the Spirit of God to God's people. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is the Savior. He is the judge. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts 2.33, day of Pentecost, Peter declares this truth, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, that is Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter is declaring Jesus raised from the dead, now ascended victoriously into heaven, having sat down at the right hand of the Father. He is the one, Jesus, the living Messiah, is the one who is pouring out this gift that you're witnessing, the gift of the Spirit of God. And the New Testament is clear that now every person who comes to faith in Jesus on this side of the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ, every new covenant believer receives the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. Every true believer in this room, you have the Holy Spirit living in your life. He is a permanent resident, and that is a new covenant gift. That is not what Old Testament saints experience. They experience the work of the Spirit. Obviously, there is no salvation apart from the work of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men and women, but the permanent indwelling of the Spirit is a new covenant reality. And so in that way, the law of God has been written upon our hearts. And the Christian life is not lived in response to a system of very detailed laws by which we are managing our relationship with God. Rather, the Spirit of God, with the Word of God, enriching our hearts, is now at work in our lives, and we fulfill the law of God by the power of the Spirit out of the desires God has granted us through salvation. This is not to say that the Word of God does not still contain law. It does. It is to say that the motivation for the obedience to the Word of God that we experience comes from the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts, and He permanently indwells us. This is a bit lengthy, but I think it is helpful. And so you're going to have to listen carefully because I, I know, just like you, I hate long reading, but I do think this is helpful. This is from MacArthur and Mayhew in Biblical Doctrine. Listen to what they wrote. The historical context, speaking of the promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, the historical context of this promise was a time of apostasy in Judah. Uh, Gerardo mentioned that earlier, Pastor Gerardo. Jeremiah the prophet warned Judah that God's judgment was coming on the people because they had failed to keep the Mosaic Covenant. The recipient of the new covenant was Israel, although, the, although all the unconditional covenants, Abrahamic, Davidic, new covenant, were intended to eventually extend to Gentiles as well, Genesis 12, 2 Samuel 7, Isaiah 52. God desired Israel to be the vehicle for God's covenant, covenant plans, but as Israel was blessed, so too were Gentiles to be blessed. God contrasted the new covenant with the Mosaic covenant in that the new covenant was not like the covenant God made at the time of the Exodus. The Mosaic covenant was a conditional and nullifiable covenant that Israel constantly broke. God was faithful to the covenant, but Israel was not. The substance of the new covenant was that God would put his law within his people and write it on their hearts. They would be God's people and would wholeheartedly obey His law. They no longer needed to be compelled by an external threat. 
Obedience would be internal, and all who participated in this covenant would know God and obey Him. A new heart is the center of the new covenant. While the Mosaic law was holy, righteous, and good, Romans 7, 12, it did not, the covenant itself, did not enable people to obey. Yet the new covenant enables God's people to lovingly serve Him. As God places the Holy Spirit within His people, God will cause them to walk in His statutes and obey His rules. The various New Covenant passages reveal both spiritual and physical blessings. A new heart, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and forgiveness of sins are the spiritual blessings at the center of the covenant. Yet, there are also national and material blessings, such as a united and restored Israel in the land of promise, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and material prosperity for Israel. Isaiah 61, Jeremiah 32, Ezekiel 34. The spiritual, physical, And national promises are all important and all need to be fulfilled. The new covenant is in effect in this church age. Those who trust in Jesus the Messiah are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, participate in the full promises of the new covenant. Those who proclaim the gospel in this age are presenting the new covenant. Paul said that God has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3. Yet, while while spiritual blessings of the new covenant are in effect for the church, national and physical promises of the new covenant regarding Israel still need to be fulfilled. The Lord thus declared, behold, the days are coming when Israel will receive the salvation promised in the new covenant. This will occur when Jesus returns. Close quote. And I agree with every word of that. So you have the spiritual blessings. We experience that this moment In the church, you have the national, physical blessings. Those will be fulfilled when Jesus returns from heaven to earth. What you have in our verses is a transformation. Jesus takes elements of the Passover, and he uses those elements to institute his supper, which calls us to remember him and the fact that the new covenant has now been inaugurated. And and with that knowledge... As we'll talk about tonight, we're also looking for His second coming, even as we remember what He accomplished in His first coming, everything necessary to save us from our sins and to bring us to God. Transformation is on display in our verses. Second word, substitution. Substitution. Now, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, He broke it. And giving it to the disciples, He said, take, eat. This is my body. Verse 28, for this is my blood of the covenant. This is after he's taken the cup. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. God's plan to save sinners, often referred to as the covenant of grace. God's plan to save sinners has this promise that is repeated to us over and over again in Scripture. Here's the promise. I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will be their God, and they will be my people. The promise that we will live forever, God in our midst, in the presence of God. Genesis 17, verse 7 And I will establish my covenant between me and you. This is the Abrahamic covenant being spoken of. And your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. There's the promise. I will be God to you and to your offspring. I will be their God. They will be my people. Jeremiah 31, 33 This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 32, verse 38. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts 
that they may not turn from me. Writer of Hebrews talking about the new covenant says in chapter 8, verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then you go to the very end of the Bible, book of Revelation 21, you see the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 1 says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. From Genesis to Revelation. This is the promise of salvation. This is the promise of redemption. I will be their God. They will be my people, and I will dwell with them. The question is, how would Jesus accomplish this? How would he get his people to that end? How would he give this gift to us that God promises and all of these salvation promises? How would he make God, our God, how would he make us his people? How would he establish a way for God to dwell with us forever? Answer, he did this by serving as our representative. He came into the world to save his people from their sins. We are a people given by the Father to the Son for the purpose of redemption before time. Jesus then, the eternal son, stepped out of heaven, came into the earth, born of a virgin, coming into the world, representing a people. He would live for that people. He would then die for that people. He would be raised for that people. And then the Spirit of God would apply his finished work to that people granting repentance and faith in the one who accomplished it all so that by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, salvation would be accomplished. The only way for us to be saved is Jesus had to be the last Adam. Just as Adam was a representative for all of us who would descend from him by nature, So that when Adam fell in the garden, we all fell with him. So Jesus came into the world to represent a new humanity, a saved humanity. So that when he lived, we were all being saved by his life. When he died, we were all, we can all trace our salvation to the cross. That's where he saved us, by dying in our place. When he was raised, our future, everlasting, resurrected life was guaranteed. And he is coming again to finish what he has begun, so that when he returns, we will all be raised from the dead and conform to his image and forever live in the presence of God because our substitute, our representative, did for us what he did. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Christ died once for sins, once for all who will be saved by his death, the just in the place of the unjust. Hebrews 9, 11 says this, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 
Jesus served as our sin sacrifice. He laid down his life. He offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, his own blood is the presentation to God for our forgiveness and our reconciliation. Verse 15 says, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you, the the old covenant ratified with blood. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, He has appeared once for all that at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This is how Jesus saved us, you see. He died as our representative, our substitute, our sin sacrifice in our place. His death answering for all, atoning for all of our sins His righteousness now given to us as a gift for perfect acceptance with God. He has accomplished it once for all, not needing to be sacrificed again and again and again, which, by the way, the perversion of these verses on display in the Roman Catholic Mass is an abomination because the Roman Catholic Mass is declaring that Christ is being sacrificed every time the Mass is celebrated. No, He died once, once to answer for all of our sins and presents his own blood before the Father for the forgiveness of his people. This required the incarnation. This required the eternal son taking to himself an additional nature. His divine nature having no beginning. He is God of very God from all eternity, but his human nature had a beginning in time, in history. Now, his, his body determined plan from all eternity, but The execution of that divine plan takes place in history and his his human nature has a beginning. Born of the Virgin Mary so that he had a real body. And he says here that this bread he's giving to his disciples speaks of that body. Take, eat, this is my body. Now he's standing right in front of them as he does this. He's not saying that this is literally his body. He's saying the bread symbolizes his body. This is the reality of the incarnation. The bread speaks of the true humanness of Jesus. It also speaks of the fact that he is now our life giver. In his very person, we find eternal life. In what he has done, we we now as believers are nourished and sustained and fed. This is what Jesus declared in John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, verse 53, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me. And I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. 
Our substitute is our life giver. Our substitute is our food and drink. Our substitute is our sustainer. We, we are brought to life by receiving him. We continue as we know him. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. How do you know those who, have, who are able to say sincerely and genuinely, spiritually, salvifically, how can you say that Jesus really is your bread and your drink? Well, the evidence that you've said it in truth is that you understand that now you're to die to sin and live to righteousness. To say that Jesus is your true food and your true drink and then to live a life in contrary to everything that he commands and to live a, a life that's in, in contrast to the very testimony he gave concerning our sins by laying down his life on the tree. I mean, if, if sin is such a serious thing, he had to die to reconcile us to God. How shall we go on living in the very things that he died to free us from? Someone who says that Jesus is their substitute, but then they live a life that dishonors him. They are living the life of a liar. And he speaks of his blood. Verse 27, he had taken this cup and he gives thanks and he gives it to them and he says, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. His bloody death, the shedding of his blood for the remission of our sins, the atonement for our sins. Leviticus 17, 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. God teaching these lessons through all the Old Testament sacrifices beginning in the Garden of Eden when he closed Adam and Eve with the skins of animals. There had to be a sacrifice there. So from the very beginning you have the shedding of blood necessary for the forgiveness of sins symbolically pointing to the one who would come and lay down his life as our substitute to pay for all of our sins. Hebrews 9.22 repeats this, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Transformation. Jesus takes what was used in the Passover meal. He institutes something that speaks of him. Substitution. The bread speaks of his body. The fruit of the vine, red in the cup, speaks of his blood. Both speak of his incarnation and his substitution. Came into the world to save a people for God, lived for us, died for us, has been raised for us. He now is our true food and our true drink. Only in him do you have eternal life. And if you have him, he feeds your soul, sustains your soul. The very one who gave you life is your life. And he is your life until you're all the way home meeting with the promise found in the covenant of grace throughout the scriptures. They will be my people. I will be their God and I will dwell with them forever. All of this on display as Jesus institutes his table, his supper. And so to be saved, you have to look to him. We're not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to God's mercy. We are saved by our substitute. Christ brings us to God. Let me finish this morning. Five closing observation statements. First of all, as I said a moment ago, I just want to underscore this. It ought to be plain that when Jesus spoke of his body and his blood, he's giving bread and wine as symbols. He's right there in their midst as he's saying, this is my body, this is my blood. He's saying, these elements speak of my body, speak of my blood. So tonight, when we celebrate the Lord's table together, this is something our Savior gave to us, the sign of the new covenant, and it is meant to call to our mind everything that he did to save us from our sins and to bring us to God. 
It is symbolic in nature. Now, there's real fellowship that occurs at the table. Our Lord is here with us this morning. He walks in the midst of his churches. He'll be with us around the table that he ordained. So we know real fellowship in the observance of the ordinance he gave, but the elements are symbolic. Which leads to the second thing I want to say, and that is, have you entered into the reality that the symbols speak of? To partake of the symbols, but to have not entered into the reality of which the symbols speak is tragedy. There will be many people who partook of communion services who will not be in heaven, which means that they participated in something externally that they never knew the reality of it internally. So I want to ask you this morning, have you been brought to God? Have you looked to Jesus alone for a right standing before holy God? Have you looked at the incarnation and said, he came into the world for me, He lived for me. He died for me. He became a man. He took to himself a real human nature to save someone like me. And then have you looked at the shed blood on the cross and said, that blood was shed for the remission of my sins. For a right standing with God, I'm not looking to my performance. I'm not looking to my goodness. I don't have any. If I should be saved by my goodness, I'm lost forever. It is by my substitute that I'll be saved. It is Jesus alone who brings me to God. Have you been brought to God by looking to Christ? If you had, would you say amen? Amen. Thank God for our substitute. And then I want to ask you, are you feeding on the Son of God? Isn't it almost scandalous the way that Jesus described himself? In fact, it was in John 6. Many disciples stopped walking with him because he put it in such scandalous terms when he says that his body is true food and his blood is true drink. But isn't that scandalous in the world in which we're living to say that Jesus is my life? I'm not living according to your way of thinking. I'm living according to the Word of God. I'm not living according to your priorities. I'm living according to the priorities set forth in Scripture. I'm not living for this world. This world is passing away. My citizenship is in heaven. I'm headed toward a better country. And every saint of God, Hebrews chapter 11, has looked for that their entire lives and confessed that they're strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I mean, it's an offensive message that Christians joyfully embrace. This is not our home. And Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Do you know what it is to feed on your Savior. He is your food. He is your drink. He is your life. And if He is, then you've also embraced the very message that came out of His mouth, which is go and sin no more, which is not to say we're going to be sinless, but to say we're not pursuing a course of sin. We're pursuing the course of Christ. And is that on display in your life, that you have turned from a life of sin that you had plenty of time to enjoy, which is really misery, when you were lost, but now the Lord has brought you out of that misery and out of that death into life, and now your life is set on pleasing Him. Can you say that is your ambition, to please the one who gave His life to save your soul? And then I would ask you finally, have you taken your place publicly among God's people by baptism. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the signs of the new covenant. Circumcision under the old covenant. Baptism, the Lord's Supper under the new covenant. This is what marks the people of God. We identify with His people through believers' baptism. And then we participate together in the remembrance of what Jesus did to bring us to God through the Lord's Supper. So that if you say, I know Jesus, but you have not followed him in believer's baptism, you don't match the New Testament picture of a Christian. Show me the people in the New Testament who refused baptism and were genuine Christ followers. I'm not talking about people who had no opportunity to be baptized like the thief on the cross. I'm talking about those who say they know Jesus and now they refuse baptism. 
those people don't exist on the pages of Scripture. So if the Lord has saved you, if your faith is in the Son of God, what is the first step of obedience that you take as a new child of God? You, fought, you obey the command of your Savior, Matthew 28, to be baptized. You identify yourself with Jesus through the ordinance of believers' baptism. We're not baptized in the name of Jesus. Yes, we're baptized in the name of the Trinity. Matthew 28 makes that clear. But what, what makes Christian baptism an offense to the Jewish world is that when you're baptized in the name of Jesus, you are declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. You're declaring that Jesus is the Son of God. You're declaring that Jesus is one with the Father. You are a Christ follower, and believer's baptism sets you apart. I sometimes say to people, it, it's, it's, it can be compared to a wedding ring, right? This does not make me married. I can take it off, and I'm, I'm, I've still been married 40 years, just as sure as if it was on my finger. But imagine me leaving it off and my wife saying to me, why don't you wear it? Imagine any answer I might offer. It won't fly, will it? Okay. But then imagine something even worse. Imagine that I don't want to be identified with her. Now, I want to ask you, how can you say that you love Jesus? He gave his life to save you from the wrath of God. What, what is your answer for not wanting to be baptized? What is a good answer for not wanting to be publicly identified with him? When that is the sign that he gave, that he commanded, it's not something we made up. It's not something we came up with. This is what the Lord delivered to us, even as Paul describes the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to give you what the Lord delivered. And so baptism and the Lord's Supper, this is how we identify with our Savior. Tonight we'll come back and we'll talk about hope and worship on display in this text. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the deep, doctrinal truth on display on the very night when our Savior was betrayed against the darkest background we have the most beautiful depiction of our Savior we have light multiplied reasons for our worship and I pray we would take these things into our hearts and the result would be just that, worship. I pray for anyone who has yet to place their faith in your son. May they see there is no other way to be saved. There is no, no other way to be reconciled to God. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. We will be saved by a substitute or by no other. And Lord, I pray for anyone who has yet to be saved, that even now they would place their faith in your Son for life. And I pray for every professing Christian who is yet to be baptized, I pray that they would put away that disobedience and follow their Lord in the very right that He ordained by which we would be identified with Him. Lord, let these words Feed us, let these words encourage us, let these words steal our courage, fortify our backbone, spiritual backbone in this world. Let us realize that Jesus is our true food and our true drink. We love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together.